Welcome to Disciples of Christ History. My name is Steve Riggis. I'm a member here at Liberty Christian Church in Liberty, Missouri. I am leading a 15-week series on the history of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I've been asked to say a little bit how this series came about. A few of you may know that I'm currently working on a book called Seeking Christ. It's about the difference between liberal Christians and conservative Christians. In the end, it will attempt, suggest at least, to find a way to bridge their differences. In working on that book, I recently completed a pretty long chapter on the history of Christianity. The second factor is that Dave Culver, the pastor of this congregation, asked me last summer to teach a series on the history of the Disciples of Christ, as there were a fair number of members of this congregation who really weren't aware of that. The third factor came in, and this got the region involved. I'm currently men mentoring a candidate for commissioning in the region. And as part of the process, he has to take a class in the history and polity of the Disciples of Christ. Unfortunately, there's no really good local option for that. And in speaking with the region, they said if he watches this series, it would fulfill that criteria for him, but they would also like to put it on the regional website for anyone else who wanted to study the history and polity of the Disciples of Christ. I am honored to have you as my guest for this, and thank you for being here. Good morning. Welcome to week three of Disciple History. This is called The Rock. And what does this say? God is nowhere. God is oh, here. Right. It could be, it, right, it, it's, it could be either one. And I want you to keep that in mind today because just as different people can read that different, the same thing differently, so people can read things in the Bible differently. Now we are about 846, 847. Roughly two hours from now, we'll be near the end of the service and Dave will give the invitation to come forward. And I was thinking about this, that you know, you know typically when somebody comes forward, we give them the right hand of Christian fellowship. I guess now it's the right elbow of Christian fellowship or the right fist bump of Christian fellowship. But when somebody comes forward in the Disciples of Christ Church, now this, in this church we always ask for a profession of faith, and some, that's not the case. Some it's simply the first time, and if you're a transfer, welcome. But if you come forward to join Liberty Christian Church, or any Christian church, are we going to say, well, you know, before you join, we, we have a few questions. Now, the second coming of Christ Based on the book of Revelation, are you a pre-tribulationalist, pardon me, a premillennialist, an amillennialist, or a postmillennialist? And if you are a premillennialist, if you are a premillennialist, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? Do we ask that? No. Do we ask you, you know, what do you think of speaking in the speaking in tongues? Is this a gift of the spirit? Is this Babel or is this from Satan? Do we ask that? Do we ask you what you think of LGBT issues in the church? Do we ask you what you think of abortion? No. What's the one thing we ask? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Did we make that up? No. Where did it come from? This is from Matthew, the 16th chapter, and the, the center verse is Matthew 16, 16. But I'll read the whole thing. This is Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, 
son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I will, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We take this, the, the good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, to be our rock, our cornerstone. I see some heads bobbing up and down, thank you. Are we the only church that takes that as their foundation? No. What other denomination rests their hope on this passage? The Roman Catholic Church, as, as we will see today. This is kind of a tall order. We are, and again, the God is now here or God is nowhere. How disciples read this and how Roman Catholics read it, two different things. Now, this is kind of, I, I don't know how long this is going to last this morning. We're covering roughly 1,200 years of Christian history. From the time Christianity became legal in 313 to when the Reformation officially started in 1517. And some of the stuff we cover will go a little beyond that, or a little before that actually. What do you know about the Roman Empire? It was big. I mean, it, it, its maximum had started, you know, it was up where England is and Wales, went all the way around the Mediterranean. It was large. And indeed, it was probably too large, too large for one person to govern. And so they began to appoint an emperor for the east and an emperor for the west. They were called Augusti and then they had an assistant called Caesar. And even though the Augusti were supposedly uh, equal, one was usually more equal than the other. There was like a senior one. And that way they began to govern separately the western half, which is primarily Latin, and the eastern half, which was primarily Greek. Now, if you remember world history, Christianity became legal in 313. It became the official religion about 363 AD. The Roman Empire split for good in 395 AD into the west and into the east. And how this story proceeds is very different, a little different in the east and the west. What churches have bishops? Methodists. Methodists. Catholics. Catholics. How about others? Eastern Orthodox, Episcopalians. Do disciples of Christ have bishops? You're wrong. <laughs> you are wrong. Let me ask you, this. there's a few disciples of Christ bishops. Let me ask you this. Could I ever be a disciples of Christ bishop? No. Could Dave? Could Laura Phillips? Could Bill Roseheim? We could never become bishops. You know why? We're white. You think I'm joking, but back in the late 1800s, in the Appalachian region, there were a group of, I believe they were called Churches of Christ, Disciples of Christ. And they've always maintained their affiliation with the Disciples of Christ. And if you go and look at one of their websites, there's a bishop preaching, but by golly, that chalice is there. And so there are still a few African-American churches, disciple churches, that have bishops. Anyway, that's, that's a trivia point. But there are bishops. And we talked about Methodist. Catholic, Roman Catholic. Eastern Orthodox, Lutherans, we didn't mention that, 
in Episco Anglicans Episcopalians. Oh my. Are all bishops created equal? No. If you look at these, I'm going to circle in red. This is kind of a jagged red. That's kind of a messy board. What is different other than marital status of a Methodist bishop or a Roman Catholic bishop? And gender also. What's different? Something incredibly important. Or what's the difference between a Methodist bishop and an Episcopal bishop or an Orthodox bishop? Has anybody ever heard of something called apostolic succession? <coughs> I see some head shaking. Anybody want to tell me what apostolic succession is? It is the idea in the New Testament there are the apostles. You know, the classic 12 apostles plus one for Paul. And if you read the New Testament, there is an authority that they have that other people don't. You remember, what was his name? I think it may have been, was it Simon the Sorcerer? One guy named Simon who, when he saw Peter lay his hands on people and they suddenly had this experience, remember he goes to Peter and said, hey, can I buy this? And he got quite a talking to by Peter. But there was, there apparently was an authority that only the apostles had. Now, our fundamental Baptist brothers and sisters would say this. That is true. They had a special authority to perform miracles and they could say I was Peter. I could give it to Roger. But after that it wasn't transferable. So when did the apostles die out? 60s, 70s AD. When would the people that they had anointed die out? maybe hundreds, early hundreds. Now, a traditional Protestant view, at least among non-charismatic Protestants, is that once those gifts of the apostles, once the apostles died, once the people that they had ordained with these gifts died, that was gone. And that's why you don't see things happen like in the New Testament today, the miracles. Now, our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox, the Anglican Church, take a very different position on that. They would say that the apostles had an authority in the church. I mean, and that's true. Any organization where the founder or founders is still alive, that person usually exerts some authority. At the end of the day, who's the final authority on Microsoft? Bill Gates. As long as the 12 apostles plus one Paul were alive, they would be the final arbiters of what went in the church. You'll remember the Jerusalem conference. It was Peter, Paul, John, and James, the brother of Christ, who got together and they basically said, okay, this, this is how it is. And as long as the founders, well, Jesus was the founder, but you know what I meant. As long as the original apostles were there, they had the final say. Now, according to these religions, that before they died, they put their hands on, they ordained people, they consecrated people. We would all agree to that. But their idea is that once you were consecrated by an apostle or apostles, you had their power. And, it, and unlike the Protestant view, it didn't die out after the first generation. That say, I was, I, was, I was Peter, 
And I, you know, ordained Roger and I ordained Alan and Gary. They didn't ordain women in those days. And when I'm gone, they have my power as a bishop, my power as an apostle, because I specifically ordained them. But they're mortal. So how do we carry it on? Maybe the three of them get together and say, Kellen, we want to ordain you a bishop. And then according to the Catholic view, Kellen would have the power. And that would go on and on and on and on and on. Now, this is called apostolic succession. The idea that the bishop in any of these churches, they were ordained, they were consecrated by three bishops who were consecrated by three bishops, who were consecrated by three bishops, who were consecrated by three bishops, by three bishops all the way back to the 12 apostles. Now, there's nothing, nothing in the New Testament that talks about apostolic succession. But that is something that is firmly believed. Now, Methodists don't claim this. Disciple bishops don't claim this. Lutheran, certainly some of the Scandinavian churches, Lutheran churches believe it. American Lutherans are a little different story that too long to talk about today. But apostolic succession is a huge deal. Now, what's funny is Roman Catholics will say, yeah, we got it. And we'll agree the Eastern Orthodox have it. And Orthodox say, yeah, we have it. And the Catholics have it. And the Anglicans say, we got it. The Orthodox have it. The Catholics have it. The Orthodox will say, yeah, we've got it. The Anglicans have it also. The Roman Catholics will say, oh, no, they don't have it. And you know why? I love this story. Let me get a drink first. In 2009, when Barack Obama became president, that was obviously historic inauguration. A lot of people were nervous. That was the first time the Chief Justice John Roberts had presided over an inauguration. And between Mr. Roberts and Mr. Obama, they fouled up the oath of office. Do you remember that? They left the word out. And so people began to wonder, is Obama really president? And so, out of an abundance of caution, the next day, Chief Justice Roberts came to the White House, swore Obama in again, using the right words. Any of you remember that? That's a modern day example. The Roman Catholics claim the Anglicans, Episcopalians, don't have apostolic succession because in the 1600s, you know, when the three bishops got together and put their hands on the new bishop, they didn't say the magic words right. And because of that, they will say, yeah, you have apostolic succession, but it's not reciprocal. Now, why am I making such a big deal out of this? Churches claim that claim apostolic succession is important for two reasons. Let me give you the first one. What are the seven sacraments in the Catholic Church? Baptism, Eucharist, Lord's Supper, confirmation, marriage, ordination, anointing of the sick, and confession. Now, who besides a priest can perform any of those? Any Christian can do a baptism, and when a couple gets married, they actually are the ministers of the sacrament of marriage to each other. But the other five require the presence of a bishop or a priest. Specifically, you know, let's say, let's say Paul decides, I want to be a priest. But you know, Kellen and these guys have the power. 
And Paul says, ah, I don't like them. So I'm just going to set myself up as a priest. Well, I'm disciples of Christ, you could do that. Can you do that in one of these churches? Because, wh why? No legitimacy. Right. Absolutely no legitimacy. And so to have the sacraments, you have to have a priest who was ordained by the bishop, who was or consecrated by three bishops, on and on and on. And people who believe this take this dead serious. If there's a website called Catholic Hierarchy, and it lists pretty near every bishop ever in the history of Catholicism. I looked it up this week. James Johnson, the Roman Catholic Bishop of Kansas City, St. Joseph, he can trace his lineage back to about the 1500s. The same as Archbishop Nauman in Kansas City, Kansas, he can trace his lineage of the three people who laid hands back to the 1500s. Now, interestingly, they can't trace it that well. In the Episcopal Church in America, every bishop is assigned a number, starting with one. When the Episcopal Church in this country began about 1789, the first bishop was one, then two, then three, and they're up over a thousand now. But there actually is a table. Bishop 516 was ordained, consecrated by Bishop you know, 412, they actually have a table that shows the whole succession because they take this seriously. And again, why? Because to be able to confer the sacraments, it's important. You remember that song at Calvary? Mercy there was great and grace was free. There my ransom soul found liberty at Calvary. Anybody remember that? I don't think they sing that in Catholic churches. And don't get me wrong, Protestants and Catholics both believe that we're saved by the grace of God. No one saves themselves. But the difference is if either one of the Megans sin, I'm sure that never happens, or not very often. <laughs> They don't have to come before Culver and say, bless me, Dave, for I have sinned. They can pray to God for forgiveness. Does that work if you're Catholic? Or, was last Sunday you Sunday? We had one of the teenagers at the table. Would that fly in a Catholic church? I mean, even having an elder at the table wouldn't fly. Even having Dave at the table wouldn't fly because he doesn't have the magic. It's true. <laughs> so, anyway, Dave gave me permission to share this story. This is funny. Dave, of course, was a chaplain at one time. He did most of his training at St. Luke's Hospital down by the plaza, which is, of course, Episcopalian. Now, in their chapel, when they do Eucharist, you need the celebrant to have the magic if you believe that. Some Episcopalians can be pretty liberal. Anyway, the director of the training program, the priest that was in charge of it, <laughs> this is a great story. If the bishop of Western Missouri was in town, he wouldn't let outsiders do it because the bishop might walk in. But if the bishop was gone, he would let anybody, whether they had the magic or not, say the words. But, interesting story. The seven sacraments have been called medicine for the soul. And I don't know much about sacraments, but I know a whole heck of a lot about medicine. Now you all know this, but in case somebody's watching and doesn't know this, I'm a physician. I, I preach for eight years, I practice medicine for 24 years. Preaching's my hobby. Now, physicians don't carry prescription pads anymore. But for many, many years, my wallet was in my left pocket, my prescription pad was in my right pocket. And I felt kind of naked the day they made us use the computer. But that's kind of the Catholic idea of sacraments. 
You know, if you get a bad case of poison ivy, you're going to go to the doctor and they're going to prescribe steroids, either in a shot form or they give you a prescription for prednisone. Why can't, you know, why skip the middleman? Why skip the middle woman? Why, why do we have it that you have to go to the doctor, get the prescription, and then buy the prednisone? Can't you just go and buy it yourself? Why do you need a prescription? Because if people could get prednisone for themselves, or a whole lot of other medicines for themselves, if you don't know what you're doing, bad things can happen. You know, the same as if you get a sinus infection, why not just go out and get yourself a Z-Pack? That actually isn't that good for a sinus infection, by the way. <laughs> Maybe 20 years ago, but there is resistance. If everybody could go out and get themselves antibiotics when they wanted, like Mexico, we would have more resistance to bacteria than we already have. And people would not complete the course, they'd get the wrong medicine, and a lot of bad things would happen. It takes a heck of a long time and a lot of work to get a prescription pad. And when you get that, it's basically the state of Missouri or whatever state you're practicing and saying, you have jumped through all the hoops and now you have the right to prescribe this very important thing. That's how the Catholic Church views the priest. You know, Catholic seminaries, I mean, the process of becoming a Catholic priest, from what I understand, is far more difficult than becoming a Protestant minister, or at least a Disciples of Christ minister. But once, once they finished it, a Catholic priest, an Orthodox priest, an Anglican priest, well, the Anglicans only have two sacraments. They're like the doctor who gets her his license. I can now prescribe the sacraments, which are tiny little bits of God's grace given where the church thinks they're appropriate. As opposed to Protestants who could say, the door is wide open. Why do I need this officially designated person with the magic to do it? Any questions so far? Gary. So this is where I struggle because of all of, all of what you just spent the last 20 minutes talking yes. about. Yes. I mean, it it's, seems real arbitrary. I mean, it's that, that, Gary, that is a great point because I almost forgot my last point and you brought it up. <laughs> it's absolutely, it seems very arbitrary. But you're a Protestant. The second part, it's not just being a, another story about training. Wait a minute. Yes. I'm a Protestant in the 20, 21st century. Yes. This happened a long time ago. This happened a long time ago, absolutely. But there are still people of other denominations who believe this. Let, let, let me, you brought up a great point. Aren't you glad, you know, at times it would be nice to be young again, to be healthy, to have the whole life ahead of you. But do you remember when you're fresh out of school and you apply for your first job? What do they want? Experience. Experience. Well, how do you get experience if you can't get the first job? What's that called? <laughs> A vicious cycle. A vicious circle. <laughs> the, here's how all this goes. When the apostles laid their hands on people, and they laid it on, not only did it confer the ability to perform the sacraments, but it also, just as the apostles were the final authority in the church, the people that they consecrated as bishops maintained their authority. Churches, not so much Anglicans, but Roman Catholic and Orthodox will say, this is not in the, you know, it's not, I mean, if you go to an Eastern Orthodox church and see their iconostasis there with all the things, or go to a Catholic church and then you read your New Testament, it's two different things. Absolutely. And every Protestant in the world knows that. But their position is this, it's the vicious cycle. When the hands were laid upon the bishops, they not only got the power to do the magic, 
But they also got the power from the apostles to be the final authority. So it goes like this. In this church, who has the authority to interpret the Bible? All of us. And to, to probably a lesser extent than that other Protestant churches do. But in the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, who has the power to interpret the Bible? The church. Specifically the bishops. Because, hey, they got the power. Not just to do the magic, but to be the final arbiters of what is truth. The final arbiters, they believe in the Bible as much as we do. What the vicious cycle is, they get to interpret what it means. And so what they do makes no sense to us. We do not read it in our Bibles. In their eyes, we don't have the right to do that. Does that answer your question, Gary? Well, kind of, sort of. Uh, I mean, this all took place a long time ago when they were much closer to when Christ... Uh, Absolutely. ...and all of that. So, I mean, at some point, it just seemed like it just splintered whatever this group thought, and that's the direction they went, et cetera, et cetera, and that's how you got all these... And, and that's, that, thank you again, that leads to the very next point. These churches believe in apostolic succession. Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Anglicans, some Lutherans. But again, they're not in communion with each other. And what makes, what makes Roman Catholics different, they all agree Yes, it'd be, we need this apostolic succession. But what makes Roman Catholics different is, is one thing. Some of you in Koinonia have heard me use this analogy before. Two different groups in the American government. The president's cabinet. If Mr. Biden gets mad at one of his cabinet members, what can he do? Fire, Fire him. They serve at the pleasure of the president. Does he have to ask anybody before he fires them? Not at all. You're gone. He is the head of the government, the executive branch. But think about the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Roberts and the other eight justices. Now again, as we mentioned before, the Chief Justice has the ceremonial privilege of swearing in the president. He's the chancellor of the Smithsonian. He gets to present his views first. But does his vote count any more than any of the other justices? They all, in the end, have one vote. Mr. Roberts is only the first of equals. Now, again, they all have bishops. But the head bishop in the Eastern Orthodox, the Patriarch of Constantinople, he's only first among equals. The head bishop in the Anglicans, the Archbishop Canterbury, he's only the first among equals. He has no special power that the other bishops don't have, other than one of prestige of privilege, like the Chief Justice does on the Supreme Court. Catholics are different, and here's why. We talked about the Roman Empire splitting in 395. Well, if you remember history, the Western Roman Empire, headquartered in Rome, where the Pope lives, fell to the barbarians in 476. But what about the Eastern Roman Empire, headquartered in Constantinople? Did it fall? Not for a thousand years. Yeah. There's an old saying, nature abhors a vacuum. You've heard that? That when there's an absence of power, what happens? Somebody takes the power. And in, in the eastern side of the empire, the emperor was still in business and running. 
the patriarch did not get the power because there was still an emperor. But in the Western Empire, sudden, suddenly the power structure is gone. There's no emperor. Who's there to fill the void? Pope. The Pope. Now, with time, the, the, Christ, the Catholics in the West and the Catholics at that time in the East, they began to disagree. The Eastern Catholics would say, yeah, yeah, Pope, he's, he has primacy of position. But this idea that he's the CEO of the church and can do what he wants more than any other bishop, we, we don't agree with that. Now, let's go back to God is either nowhere or now here. We talked about the rock. The disciples of Christ believed that in Matthew 16, when Peter confesses, you are the Christ, the Son, the living God, and Jesus says, you are Peter on this rock, meaning that confession, I will build my church. Now, I haven't read Greek out loud in a whole long time. I was practicing this week. <laughs> we haven't listened to Greek. <laughs> but that's true, but you can hear this. You can hear this, if I can do it right. This is This is the 18th verse. I'll read it in English. And I also to those say, Thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build of me the church. Greek. Kego de soi lego hoiti su ice petros. Kai epi tonte te petra. And I'm not going to say the other word because it's too. Did you hear the two forms of petra? Petros and Petra. It's a play on words. What was Peter's real name? Simon. And because of his nature, Jesus nicknamed him, oh my, Peter the Rock. You heard the two. Roman Catholics take this as being, saying, let me read this again in Greek. Kego de soi lego hoiti so i petros kai epi tanta ta hoiti su I'm missing this up petra. What there the Catholic interpretation of this is you are Peter rock and on this rock meaning you you personally I will build my church. Who was the first pope? Peter. Peter. You know he. When he got to Rome, we don't know. He did die there about the same time Paul did in the Neronian persecution. They would say that Peter went on to become the first bishop of Rome. And just as there's the whole thing about the apostolic succession conferring on the people, the magic, that the view not shared by the Anglicans, not shared by the Eastern Orthodox, but, shared, but kind of solely the property of the Catholic Church is this apostolic succession is true, but they're not all equal. Our guy, when Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter, and on this Peter I will build my church, that that conferred a unique power on the apostle Peter and all of his successors who became bishop of Rome. And with time, this just grew. And finally, in 10... 54 AD, these folks said enough of this. That, you know, you, you don't have this power to run everything. And with time, that power became more absolute. In 1870, is when the Catholic Church officially said that the Pope, when speaking ex cathedra, is infallible. And with time, the power of the papacy to appoint bishops, to appoint cardinals, to depose leaders of the church grew to become basically absolute. And 
they will say, yeah, you know, you Eastern Orthodox, you have valid orders. The sacraments you perform are valid. But you're not in communion with the Pope, and he's really, he's really the guy that runs everything. Questions so far? Even when there's split papacy. Very good, because we talked about the Avignon papacy last week. And it, that's the best example. I, I, wish, I wish I had brought my coin collection. Let me explain why. Because sometimes I've done this. Let's see if I have a dollar bill in here. Do you remember the old silver certificates with the blue seal? I have an old one. If I brought it in, what it would say, the United States of America upon demand will pay the bearer of this one dollar in silver. So the idea of a silver certificate was that you could actually walk into the, I mean, not anymore, but you could walk into the Treasury Department in Washington and say, here, Here's my paper, give me my silver. What was the legitimacy of our currency? That there was either silver or gold in Fort Knox or wherever that backed up the dollar. And what does this say, this Federal Reserve note? This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. What is this based on? Faith. And, you know, it, you remember the scene of The Wizard of Oz where they pull the curtain back and he's... When you had the, the two popes, or the three popes, you know, the popes moved to France because the French people wanted that. And then the Italians said, we don't like this, we're going to elect our own popes. So then we got two popes. And then you had the compromise candidate come up the three popes. Well, this whole system is built on a spiritual legitimacy. But like a Federal Reserve note, what happens to a country that loses faith in its money? It becomes worthless. And one of the things I, I suspect, I don't know how much this played into the Reformation or not, the fact that you had three, three people claiming to all be the vicars of Christ, to be at the top, caused an enormous problem. Because who was the legitimate one? So finally what they did was they had a council. They got rid of all three. They appointed a new one. And then they went back in retrospect and said, okay, you know what they actually called the others that weren't official? Anybody into particle physics? You have protons. <laughs> you, oh, you watch Star Trek at least. You have matter and antimatter. So they looked back in retrospect and said, okay, you're the Pope. And then the other was the anti-Pope. And the anti-Popes were not legitimate. But I'm sure that cast some doubt on the legitimacy of the whole operation. Any more questions? But as Gary and others have pointed out, This is, i got one more point to make, sorry. Any of you like Michael Bolton? In 1989, he did a song called Soul Provider. And I think it was S-O-U-L, but it could also be S-O-L-E. That's what the Catholic Church wanted to be in terms of sacraments, the soul provider. And why did the United States pass the Sherman Antitrust Act? to break up monopolies. Because with monopoly comes an amazing, unfair amount of power and an unfair amount of money. But in Western Europe, for much of the time, until 1517, who had the monopoly? And with that power, there comes a lot of money. Now, if you're Catholic and you die, if you've committed a mortal sin that's not forgiven, it's like monopoly. Go to jail, go directly to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200. If you have an unforgiven mortal sin, you go to hell. But there are venial sins, sins that aren't so bad. And 
but sin has both in the view a eternal component but a temporal component. You younger parents probably don't do this. But I remember one of my father's famous lines before I got spanked. This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. <laughs> and my parents could forgive my transgressions. But along with their forgiveness, there also came a human punishment in the form of a, you know, a switch. That's kind of the Catholic idea of venial sin. God can forgive you, but you still have to work the time off in purgatory. Now, I read somewhere, I don't know if this is true or not, somebody calculated the average time in purgatory was 2,000 years. And again, there's only, it's not like you're in purgatory deciding if you're going to go to heaven or hell. There's only one door out of purgatory and it's to heaven. And you'll eventually get out. But remember, it, on this rock I will build my church, and the, let me read this again, I close the Bible. And the gates of hell will not pr prevail against it. The church through the Pope has the power to get people out of purgatory sooner. Now, if you knew that mom or dad was there in purgatory and the gates of heaven could be open, wouldn't you do anything to do that? And you know, if, if say, the church is building a beautiful new cathedral in Rome, St. Peter's, not cheap, that there began to become indulgent salesmen who sold indulgences saying, if you give this money, your family member gets out of purgatory and into heaven. Wouldn't you want to do that? Or yourself. I mean, we're all going to die someday. And you know, say Rob, Roger is a rich land. Well, you do have land. You do have, you, ha you have an estate. <laughs> But say you had farms and farms and farms and farms. Now, when you died, what's your biggest concern? You want to go to heaven. But where's your first stop going to be? Purgatory. So why don't you have it in your will when you die? Sorry, Megan. <laughs> that besides what you give the kids, you're going to endow it a monastery for an order of priests or monks. And besides their priesting and monking, part of their job will be to pray every day for the repose of your soul. So that's going on for hundreds of years. Who, ta who gets the land? Who gets the money? The church. Or power over kings. We talked about last week that the Pope and King John got into a fight. And King John said, fine, I'm going to excommunicate. The Pope said, I'll excommunicate you. And King John said, I don't care. But then the Pope said, well, I'll put an interdict against your people. They can't have the sacraments until you come around. He finally came around. But you know, a king might say, I don't care about my soul. I don't care about the souls of my subjects. What the Pope could say is this. You're a Christian king leading the Christian kingdom. If you're excommunicated, you have no right to lead a Christian kingdom. Now, all the, the feudal lords had to take vows of, celib or vows of obedience to their king. But remember, the Pope can do anything. Okay, your serfs are freed from their vows of obedience. You're not a Christian in good standing. They had the right to rebel. Or, a king, the Pope can say, well, King, you're not in good standing in a Christian nation. I'm inviting the Christian kings around you to invade. It was an easy way to keep power. Finish the saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. By the Middle Ages, you had a lot of parish priests who were ignorant. They didn't know Latin. But the priests, the bishops in the city had lifestyles as lavish as any king. They frequently ignored their vows of celibacy. There was a pope who had seven kids. 
This was not what people saw in the Bible. And somebody, at least two people, decided they wanted to do something about it. They were both named John. Do you remember what their last names were? John Wycliffe. He was in England. He looked at the Bible and said, enough is enough. That none of this, none of this is biblical. We need to get the Bible into the vernacular so people can read it. We need to get rid of the church. We need to go back to the Bible and get rid of all this. John Wycliffe was lucky. He was condemned. I believe he spent the last three years of his life under house arrest, basically. But he died a natural death in his own bed. Now, his works were condemned as those of a heretic. Now, I forget if it was about 25, 27, 30 years, roughly in that range, after he died, they dug his bones up, and then they burned his, what was left of his corpse at the stake as a heretic. Now, but that's not bad because he was dead. The other John, John Huss, who lived in, oh, kind of Central Europe, he, had, he independently came to the ideas that John Wycliffe had in England. And he wrote this up. The church wasn't happy. And they said, well, you know, John, c come down. We're going to discuss this, you know. And we, we agree to give you safe passage to come down and discuss this. And what happened? They lied. He was captured. He was convicted. And unfortunately, unlike Mr. Wycliffe, he was burned at the stake while he was alive as a heretic. So people looked at this system and said, this isn't right. But the power of Christendom, the power of the state and the church together were too strong to break. Was it Bob Dylan who said, times they are a changing? Next week, we're going to talk about that, the times they are a changing. Now, I see some younger folks here. But most of us grew up in an era where there was no internet. Do you remember the Encyclopedia Britannica? And you know, door to door salesmen would go by selling encyclopedias so your kids would be smart and go to college? Or do you remember, do they, Megan, do they still teach kids in school about the, what was the thing that you had to go to look up, the something of periodicals? Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be the highlight of the whole 15 weeks. We use magazine. The Reader's Guide to Periodic Literature. No. No, but all you old folks, you remember that? I remember it, but we don't use it. Well, I, I would hope you don't use it. Okay. But if you had to write a paper and one of the newest information, You'd go to the library, and there was this book, and they had little supplements like every month, and you'd have to carefully go through and find the articles. Then you'd actually have to go to the journal. When did that end? The when the internet. The information superhighway. How? Somebody said once there'll never be any bar fights over trivia anymore, because you can just look it up. That changed society so much. The fact that we could instantly have information at our fingers. I would suggest that that was only the second time in history that an information highway opened up. And that's why next week when we talk about the times they were changing, the next reformers did not end up like Huss and Wycliffe. Questions? Comments? Funny stories? <laughs> Motions for the good of the order? See you next week. Thank you. Oh, Paul? Inquisition. Yeah. So the Spanish Inquisition, yeah. as an example, was an attempt to suppress all of this? You know, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Does nobody get that joke from Monty Python? <laughs> <laughs> I see it. The Inquisition 
did a number of things, and I would have to, I would have to get back to you on some of it was suppression of these things, but also it, it was in a lot of ways more sinister than this. That you know that there were Jews who'd forcibly been converted, and then part of what the Inquisition did was to check up and see are they really really Christians or are they still hiding as Jews? The Inquisition did a lot of bad things, just a lot of bad things. So that's not ever, the Inquisition had a part of it, yeah. But the Inquisition did other things than that. Questions? Well, yes? So, okay, so Helen's grandma is Catholic. Okay. So when she comes to visit us, bless his heart, he usually goes to two services on Sunday because he takes her to the Catholic church. Yeah. Because she can come here to church, but it doesn't count yeah. for her. Is this why it doesn't count because we don't have... The magic. the magic? We don't have the magic. That's right. That's why it doesn't count. But why can't, like, so she can't take communion here. She can take communion here, but it doesn't count. Right. They may not want her to, but we, we don't allow, we, we, I can't go there. right, I can't go. right. Even though they don't know that I'm not Catholic. Because you're, when you go up, you're supposed to go like this, I mean. I really would. I really have thought this sitting in in service, being like, man, I could really screw this up with these people. I'd be a very bad person, but I don't. I sit there and I'm nice and I'm good. Well, <laughs> I had a friend who was talking about politics. Do you remember the time, Bill Clinton, of course, a Southern Baptist, and he went to a Catholic church and came forward. And they're standing in front of this poor priest as the most powerful man in the world. Did you say, I'm sorry, Mr. President, you don't get communion? No, it's open wide, Mr. President. There's controversy about that. Who do outsiders get? And officially, no. One of, my, one of my best friends, he's passed away now, he's a Presbyterian minister, who would go to, who would go to daily mass at the local Catholic church because he liked the priest. The priest didn't care. You know, in that situation, oh, fine. I mean, there's so many people in Catholic churches now, I believe, who are not supposed to be taking mass anyway, that do, that do. Kevin Kelly had an interesting story. Kevin used to be a part of a group, multi-faith group that would meet together, I don't know how often, some Protestants and some Catholics, and against all the rules, they'd share communion together. But, you know, no, this isn't true anymore because we have pre-COVID. What would we do at the end of the service with the, the juice? Dump it. Now, I'm glad Zaborik left because I wouldn't want to tell this story in front of him. <laughs> it didn't happen here. But at my church in Hiawatha, where there was just some farm wives that were just cheap beyond belief, there was one couple that they would pour the unused juice back in. Can't, you know, waste not, want not. We pour the juice down the drain. Do Catholics do that? No way. That's the blood of Christ. And so Kevin would tell the story that when they were done, the priest would always make sure that the wine was all gone. Anyway, that's, yeah. We talk about communion and not being able to take it at the Catholic Church, but I have a good friend who was baptized the Disciples of Christ but ended up going to a Baptist church yeah. with his wife. They moved to Rolla, and he could not take communion in the Baptist church because he was not baptized in the Baptist church. He was baptized a Disciple of Christ. And s some Baptists are that way and some aren't. Yeah. And that's an individual issue. Yeah, because he could hear. Yeah, but yeah. But he couldn't there. Unbelievable. But that's, that's. And, I know. <laughs> and it's interesting, the, the Anglicans have the magic, but anybody can take, any Christian can take communion there. I told him the story about you presiding at Episcopal Eucharist. <laughs> so, covertly. Anything else? Well, we're, we're going to talk about times they are a-changing next week, and it, the story gets a little more positive. Thank you. <laughs>